I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Psalms, Psalm 24, the 24th Psalm. This morning comes to an end of this series of three psalms that go together, Psalm 22, 23, and 24, all refer to the Lord Jesus Christ in some way, known as Messianic Psalms. We find, as you recall, in Psalm 22, we talked about our suffering Savior, and in Psalm 23, our, our shepherd who faithfully leads and guides us. And this morning, we're going to talk about our sovereign king. And so if you'll look with me in Psalm 24, we're going to read it again. You follow along, and uh, let's see what God says to us this morning. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Well, in this passage, we find three things concerning our God. And we look at this last section here in verse 8, where we ask the question, Who is this King of glory? And again in verse 10, Who is this King of glory? We need to remember that He is the King of glory now and for all eternity. You know, we often sing songs, and we have to be careful of the songs that we sing, even though many songs, we love to sing them, we love some of the words, we love some of the tunes of them. But I think it's very important that we understand that when we sing songs like crown him with many crowns, we're not crowning him with anything, folks. He, he is the crown king already. We're going to cast our crowns at his feet. But I understand the... The, the message of the song. I understand that it's really simply an acknowledgement of him being our king, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think it's very important as we look in Scripture that we take our identification and on the characteristics of Christ from Scripture, not just from what we feel. You know, there's a lot of sentiment among Christians, and, and they grew up in a certain way, you know, and they'll sing. I remember growing up, and part of my family were, were, were what you would call uh, educated and others were hillbillies and they just kind of all blended together and one of the favorite songs of one of my relatives I think an uncle was uh, a cabin in the glory land and he liked this I've got a mansion over the hilltop and I remember asking one time I said can you show me in scripture where this cabin is exactly is there a cabin in glory land and he said well I don't know but he said that's all I deserve <laughs> I said, no, no, listen, we deserve the very best. Why? Because God has given his best for us to give us dwelling places in his mansion, in his place, in his house, where we're going to be living there. We oftentimes think of things in very, uh, very uh, specific terms, and we think that, that we're all going to live in little individual houses. I don't know if we are. I, I don't, really don't know. I've never been there, and if I'm going, I'm not coming back. But I want you to understand something. Wherever we live, we'll be with the Father. We'll be with our God. We'll be with this King of glory. And we're going to acknowledge Him as our King for all of eternity. I want you to look with me very quickly. We're going to come back to Psalm 24. But I want you to get uh, just a sense of this in the book of Revelation. Revelation, the uh, I guess the fourth and fifth chapters. 
Revelation. And I want us to look down in verse to 8 of chapter 4. And here we have the four beasts had each of them six wings about him and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying holy 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 Lord God Almighty which was and is and is to come and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were Created. What a tremendous uh, statement this is that these beasts, these creatures in heaven, what are they doing? Day and night, they're giving glory and praise to our God. That's what they do. People say, what are we going to be doing in heaven? We're giving praise to God. We're giving praise to God. What we always wanted to do here more perfectly. Do you ever feel like when you're worshiping God, gosh, I wish I could just worship him in a better way. I wish I could really let him know how I really feel. Well, there you will be able to. And that's all you desire to do is to do that. In chapter 5, if you'll notice here in verse 11 of chapter 5, it says, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth, under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and the Lamb, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. What a glorious sight. As we sit here this morning in this church in Lomita, California, we are talking about this same king, this same king of glory, this same Lord of lords that these who are already around the throne are singing about right now. Glory to our God. I want you to notice this in chapter 24 of Psalm 24. We see three things about this king of glory. We see him, first of all, as the creator. He is the creator. If you look in verse 1 and following, he says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Now, when you consider this, that this king of glory, he is worthy of all of our praise. Why? Because, first of all, he is our creator. He is the one who owns everything. The Bible tells us that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He even owns the hills where the cattle are. He owns the gold. He owns the silver. He owns everything that we claim is ours. He owns it all. The Bible says he is the one who gives you and me even the power, the strength to gain wealth. He is the one that provides for our every need. He is the one that even gives us the air to breathe and the capacity to breathe the air. He owns everything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It doesn't matter whether there are parts of our world that don't believe in God or not. He owns it. It doesn't matter whether they have another God that they serve. It doesn't matter. He owns everything. The Bible says there's going to come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord to the glory of God. Why? Because he owns everything. Everything is his. I was reading not long ago that they're saying that now that at the rate of growth that Muslim countries and Muslim ruled countries are expanding faster than Christian countries. It doesn't matter. Our Father owns it all. Amen. What do I care who he lets use it for a while? 
It's not my business. It's not my concern. It's not something that I need to go to war over. It's something that I need to rejoice in. That man, no matter how great and mighty he thinks he is, he doesn't own it. It belongs to God. Amen. And he has made it. The Bible tells us in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we did a study of that some time ago, of the greatness of our God some time ago. And if you recall, that when we talked about him being our great creator, one of the statements I made is that creation is not science. It's not about science. It's theology. In the beginning, God. And it's amazing how many times Christians think that they have to become experts in scientific processes and how they need to know uh, geology and how they need to know all these other things so they can somehow talk to people about God and how he is to be trusted and how he created everything. No, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You just have to say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Paul thought, and Paul had a greater mind, I think, than we do, and Paul in Romans tells us that one of the ways that you show people is that you have them consider his creation. David in Psalm 19 talked about the wonders and the glories of the heavens and how they reveal what? The handiwork of God. Listen, you don't need to have some degree or some pedigree behind your name. You need to know God. He created it all. The Bible says he, he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Well, we can think about that, how dry land appeared. Why? Because he simply said, and what happened? The waters went back. He found it upon the sea and it was there. He brought it out. When God sent the great flood to this earth, and it's amazing that if you travel in this country even, you'll see evidences of that great flood. And you'll see, you'll, you'll see fossils and you'll see all kinds of, of evidence that there was a great flood of waters that came through. Why? Because God said he was going to destroy the earth with a flood. And then he brought forth what? Well, a soggy but clean earth. You see, our God owns everything. He is the creator. I want you to look in the book of Colossians for a moment. The book of Colossians. And I want you to see in verse 14 and following... It says, in whom, of Colossians 1, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in all things, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Well, what are we seeing here? Christ is preeminent in his creation. He holds all things together. Listen, it doesn't matter whether we cool down the planet, heat up the planet, change the climate every single day. He holds all things together. And nothing is going to happen to this world until he makes it happen. Oh, there will be a time when there will be a great global heating. And this planet will be dissolved with a fervent heat. And it will be burned up. But dear friends, he is in charge. And you and I who know the Lord don't need to worry about that at all. Listen, do not think that we're going to keep this earth, this planet, in the pristine condition that it was at creation. Adam and Eve took care of that already for us. It began to die just like they began to die from the moment of their sin. 
This earth is nothing like what it was when God first created it. It looks nothing like it did. It has been changed and altered. Rivers have changed. All things have changed their courses. Listen, God, though, holds it all together. Why? Because he created it by his own power, the Bible says. His son is the creator. His son is the one who has what preeminence in all things. When we come to worship our God, are you coming worshiping the preeminent one? Are you coming realizing that there's no one like him? Are you coming to realize that he has made it possible for you and I to come to know him? That he has called us to himself. He has saved us. He has redeemed us. He owns everything. What a tremendous thing this is. In the beginning was the word, the Bible says, and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And again, all things were created by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Dear friends, he's the creator. And he keeps it all together. Listen, we live in a messed up world. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But we live in a messed up world. But that doesn't change. That doesn't change the ownership of God. That doesn't change his purpose him to slow anything down that doesn't cause him to delay what he wants to do it doesn't cause him to speed up what he wants to do everything is in his control everything well look second of all at something that I call not only is he the creator but he is the cleanser and what do I mean by that well if you look in verse 3 notice it says who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. You know what that word Selah means? It has to do with what? Stopping. It's a stop in the song. It's a stop in the psalm. Uh, it's a point to stop and consider what has just been sung or said. And when we consider the fact that none of us are capable of approaching God. Not one of us. He is the creator. Who could approach the one who created everything? How do you figure that out? Remember Job, and Job is going through all these terrible things. And he's beginning to wonder, God, why, why is this happening? I mean, I don't get this. And his friends are accusing him of everything. And Job begins to say, well, I don't know why, God, you're doing this. And all of a sudden, the Lord shows up. That must have scared him to death. And he says to Job, hey, listen. I'll answer your questions, but, be, but first, you answer mine. It's almost he says, stand up now and take it like a man. Hear what I've got to say. Where were you when I laid the foundations? Where were you when I put the stars? Where were you when I made this? How do I make snow? How do I make ice? How do I make these animals? If you can't answer those, why should I answer anything you have? You see, that's the basic work of God. But the real work that God wants us to understand is not only just that he is the creator, but he is the holy, holy, holy God. That there's nothing like him. That there's nothing that you and I, in our best efforts as human beings, could ever approach. He simply asks the question, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place in Psalm 15 it says Lord who shall abide in thy tabernacle who shall abide in thy holy hill listen we need to understand that this is a question everybody has to answer who is going to abide there who is going to be able to go to the holy hill of the Lord who is going to be able to stand there find Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 where it says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. 
He talks about his great glory that filled, his train filled the temple. The glory came all over. And Isaiah, rather than being like a television evangelist of the 21st century who said, Hey, God, how are you doing? He said, Woe is me. Woe is me. I'm undone. I'm undone lips and I dwell in people of unclean lips. He is really realizing, listen, I don't belong here. How dare I stand in your presence? Do you understand how holy God is? It's amazing to me as I deal with people and how cavalier they are about God many times. I don't like jokes about God. You notice I really don't tell jokes. I might say something funny once in a while, but that's just my personality. But I don't tell jokes when I'm going to preach. I, 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 I despise that. Amen. I think that that mocks God. And I know the modern day preacher gets up and wants to tell, you know, like he's a warm up act for something. And he, you know, he's got to tell 10 minutes worth of jokes that aren't really all that funny anyway. And then he'll say, now, take your Bibles. Well, I don't want to take a Bible then. I might want to take some Pepto-Bismol or something. I don't think we joke about God. One of the great men of the 20th century, A.W. Tozer, was a great man of God. A little hard to understand by people. He spent most of his time alone, and then he would come out and preach but one of the things that people who knew Brother Tozer would say is that he was a holy man and he was not a joker. He didn't tell jokes. He didn't laugh at what people thought was so funny. Why? Because he was a man consumed by the holiness of God. It doesn't mean he's better than anybody. It just means what? He, he saw what was really important. Last week when I was at Palm Crest, I talked about the two sisters, Mary and, and Martha, and how Martha and Mary had Jesus come to their house, and here they are in the house, and Martha's in there in the kitchen, and she's scurrying around, and she's trying to prepare things, and she's getting upset because Mary's not helping her. And you can imagine, you know, if you've ever heard this in your own house, uh, you know, banging of pots and pans, and, and the more frustrated the person is in there, the louder it becomes, and, you know, and they're slamming cabinet doors, and all kinds of, I'm not saying if you do this, I'm just saying I heard that this happens at times. And, and so we find Martha. Martha is so upset because Mary is not helping her. And she goes out to tell Jesus, listen, don't you understand? She needs to be helping me. What does Jesus say? Martha, you're troubled about so many things. You're troubled by so many things. Mary has chosen the better part. What was Mary doing? Sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him, hearing his words. That's the better part. That's the better part. Listen, I talk to people a lot, and, and they profess to be Christians, or they profess that they're seeking the Lord, whatever that means. The Bible says no man seeks after God. But here you find people always seeking after God, but they're involved in this thing, and they're, you know, they, they do this kind of activity, that kind of activity. They're out there living for the world. Listen, they never want to witness to anybody. They don't ever want to come to a prayer meeting. They never want to come and, and share the gospel with anybody. They never want to do anything that has to do with serving God. But they're always out doing something that the world does. Come on. We are the people of God. As a matter of fact, we're called a peculiar people. That means peculiarly His. We belong to Him. Have you noticed in your own life that at times there is a straying from where you used to be. Oh, I used to be, boy, I used to be really on fire for the Lord. Boy, I used to be doing this. I used to do that. I, 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 I used to be involved in that. Well, why? Why was it used to be? What happened? What did God do to you that would cause you to stray from Him? Nothing. God's been nothing but good to you. But He's always been holy.
you find in the book of Revelation, we're not going to turn there, but when, when they're going to open the seals, and John begins to cry because there's no one who is worthy to open the seals. He's, he, you know, he's looking for someone to open it. And he knows he's not worthy. And he knows no one in heaven is worthy that he can see. But then he hears there is one. There is one who's worthy. Dear friends, I would say that first and foremost, when we consider this, these three verses here, that we need to consider the fact that there is only one who can ascend to the hill of the Lord. There's only one who has clean hands and a pure heart. There's only one who has not lifted his soul to vanity nor sworn deceitfully. And he's the one that receives the blessing of the Lord. And that is our dear Savior. But not only just for him, but for all who will come to him. Dear friend, our salvation is his salvation. He is the one. People talk about that they want to be a soul winner. He is the soul winner. We simply obey him. He cleanses us. The Bible says that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all our unrighteousness. You can't do anything, dear friend, for yourself. He cleans you. His, your hands will be cleansed that you might do serve him, that you might worship him. The Bible talks about lifting up holy hands. Listen, hands that have been cleansed. God wants to change our hearts and make us just like he is. There's nothing wrong, please hear me, there is nothing wrong with you living your life completely for the purpose of pleasing and honoring him. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not weird to do that. You see, I think sometimes the way Christians act, it's almost like a man has to stop by the mall to pick up that his wife asked him to pick up. And so he pulls into the mall and there he sees his wife there with her friends and they're, they're having a shopping trip and here they're there and, and he goes, hi, honey. And she looks like, what? I don't know you. Why are you honeying me? Why don't no. Well, he's concerned about that. Why? Because that's his wife. Why doesn't she want to respond to him? Why doesn't she show love? Why doesn't she show that she really cares about him? Well, sometimes I think that's what we do with our dear Savior. Oh, we come to church on Sunday because we know, by golly, if I don't come to church, it won't be long until Pastor Miller sends me that little text. Hi, I've been missing you. Hope you're not sick. Have you gotten those before? I, I, I debated one time on putting, hope you are sick, because that would be the only reason I would accept. You say, well, he should mind his own business. Well, that's kind of what I do. Okay? No, I, I'm concerned if you're not here, not just so that I have nobody to preach to, but that you need to hear the word of God and I need to hear the word of God and you as well. We need to be together. But it's always amazing how many times I'll run into Christians who they're involved in this activity or that activity and it's not that they're wicked, terrible activities. It's just that they are things that you wonder, why are you doing that? You see, I, th I really believe, I mean, we don't get all the habits that people have. It's, it has really nothing to do with it. It has to do with your heart. Listen, I, I know people that support every, every movement that comes along in this country. Man, if somebody wants to marry the same sex, okay, well, you know, I don't agree with it, but you know what? Uh, you know, that just, you know, uh, you can't stop love, you know? And this comes from Christian people who, who know the scripture. What does it say? 
You say, well, Pastor, you know, you say the wrong thing, people are going to be mad at you. I'm used to it. Listen, you don't have to say it in a mean way, but you need to come to people and say, hey, listen, have you considered what the Bible says here? God wants us to live holy lives. And holiness cannot be achieved apart from God's word and reading it and obeying it. Amen. You can't live the way God wants you to live by just kind of guessing your way through life. You've got to come to this book. So we need to understand that he cleanses us. Whosoever will may come. Well, it's interesting that God calls us to himself. You remember when he called you to himself? And you came, didn't you? Oh, you think, well, I didn't want to be dragged to God. You weren't dragged. You came willingly. Why? Because he he gave you a want to. I want to leave my sin. I want to leave this life. I want to come to Christ. And this is what he says in verse, in, in verse 6. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Which generation? The ones who ascend to the hill of the Lord. The ones who stand in the holy place. The ones who have a desire for clean hands and a pure heart. The ones who don't lift up their soul to vanity. Listen, this is the generation of them that seek the Lord. Those who are not living this way are not that generation. Well, Pastor Miller, I don't know if you can judge like that. Well, I'm not judging. I'm just reading Scripture. Amen. If a person has no desire for holiness, if a person has no desire to ascend to the hill of the Lord, if a person has no desire to be like Christ, they don't belong to Him. And it's time sometimes to just sit down with somebody and say, Hey, listen. I've been observing your life. And I don't see this in it. What's going on? Oh, you say, well, you might offend them. That's okay. People are offended all the time. They get over it. I would rather offend you and drive you to Scripture so that you see what it says and you repent of your sin than I would just to say, well, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I do want to help your soul reach Christ. So he is our creator. He is our cleanser. He is the only one. You can't cleanse yourself. We sing that old song, what can wash away my sins? Nothing. It doesn't give you multiple choice, does it? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He's the cleanser. But thirdly, very quickly, verse 7 says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. I notice there's another Selah. We're to consider that, aren't we? Who is this King of glory? Well, he is our conquering king. He is our conquering king. Old Testament Word that was called Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner, the Lord who conquers. He is our conquering king. What did he conquer? Well, the Bible says he conquered both, both sin and the grave. He conquered death and hell. He conquered sin. He conquered the power of sin against us. He defeated the enemy. He went to the cross. Listen, when it talks about this one who is the king of glory in verse 8, who is strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. What battle has he fought? Well, there are those who say, well, this refers to the battle of Armageddon. When he, no, no, it is the battle that he fought for our souls. 
He is strong. He is mighty in battle. He's the king of glory. He defeated the enemy. And he's powerful enough to set you free from whatever you're bound in. He is powerful enough to change the most wicked, vile person. He is the king of glory. Oh, listen, we need to rejoice in who he is. That great king of glory, the one who is the conquering king. And notice, he says again, in verse 9, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. The king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Well, he's the king of kings and Lord of lords, is he not? And he is coming again. Isn't he coming? Oh, listen, we, we can argue, we can debate with people about when he's coming, whether there's a rapture before tribulation, whether there's a rapture after tribulation, whether this happens or that happens. And I really would say to you that after being around for a long, long time, that I respect people on all sides of that debate. Why? Because they bring out some wonderful scriptures. And I'm not mad at any of them. I think that they should be right like I am, but, but I, don't, I, don't, I don't argue with them about it. But I want you to know he is coming. Amen. And I want you to read with me, follow along as I read from Revelation chapter 20. Some of you are just excited when I say Revelation, aren't you? Revelation chapter 20. And I, I like to read Revelation 20, uh, verse 1, beginning there. And I'm just going to read down until we made the point. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. No one ever says amen when we say that. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and the judgment, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went upon, up on the breadth of the earth and com encompassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works, and, the, and death and hell were cast in a lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Well, what a tremendous passage that is. Because what does it tell us? It tells us the king of glory rules and reigns. It tells us the king of glory, once he comes, it's done. There is nothing more to do. He enters in. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the one who is the victor over all 
wickedness and evil. Not us. We, we win the victory. How? By our faith. But our faith is where? In him. We're not trusting what we do. We're trusting what he has done. And dear friend, I want to tell you this. This one who is our sovereign, who is the creator of all, who is the cleanser of every sinner who will come, and who is the conquering king, is not your king until you come to him. And this morning, I would encourage you, if you don't know the Lord, stop, stop delaying. Stop putting it off. Stop saying, well, one day I will. Stop saying, yeah, one day I'm going to give this a lot of thought and I'm going to come through with this. Listen, give your life to him now. Yield to him now. Surrender your all to him and live a life that shows that you've surrendered all to him. Don't just say words and go out of this place like so many times before and do nothing but simply say the words. It's more than just words. It is your life. Yielding your all to him. Who is the king of glory? He is our sovereign God who will have his way and nothing will ever stop him let's stand together as we pray oh Lord God we thank you for your great love for us thank you oh God for that great grace and mercy that caused you to leave heaven's glory and come